Einen wunderschönen guten Abend zu Infoschall mit Jens Blecker und... Ah, Schall, hallo. Wir freuen uns heute Abend wieder mal zwei besondere Gäste zu Besuch zu haben. Wir werden das ganze Interview auf Englisch führen, aber teilweise hinterher auf Deutsch übersetzen. Und ich würde sagen, lieber Lars, stell du doch mal unsere beiden Gäste vor. Ja, das ist äh, zum einen ähm, Mike Rupert und zum anderen ist das Dr. Daniele Ganser. Dann sagen wir erstmal Hello to California. Hello, Mike Rupert. It's great to be with you and all my friends in Germany. We are very happy to have you with us. And we say hello to uh, Switzerland, Lugano. We say hello to Dr. Daniele Ganser. Hello, nice to meet you. And me, it's a great pleasure to meet you. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, let uh, me introduce you both. Um, first, Mike. Well, he was um, born 1951 in Washington, D.C. Uh, he studied at the University of California in Los Angeles. Um, and he was then working for uh, the Los Angeles Police Department. And afterwards, he became a freelance investigative journalist. In 1998, he founded uh, the website From the Wilderness. And um, it, it was first dedicated uh, to drug, CIA, and covered operations. And after September 11th, it became um, a real good news source for alternative information in regard to 9-11. And uh, in 2004, he published the book Crossing the Rubicon, The Decline of the American Empire at the End of the Age of Oil, which was published at uh, New Society Publishers. And in 2009, he published Confronting Collapse, which was published at Chelsea Green Publishing. And he was the subject of, uh, of a documentary uh, called Collapse. And he is now the publisher of the website CollapseNet. And he um, presents a radio show at the Progressive Radio Network called The Lifeboat Hour. Okay, and then we have Dr. Daniele Ganza who was born 1972 in the city we are now connected with him, Lugano, in Switzerland. And he's a historian at the University of Basel, and he is a researcher, a peace researcher, and a book author. Uh, he was working at the Center for Security Studies at uh, Zurich, and since 2006, he is now working as an historian at the University of Basel, and he is the head of a research pro, uh, project there on the peak oil um, topic. And he is also a founding member of the Association for the Study of Peak Oil and Gas in Switzerland. In 2008, he published, um, or no, it was in 2005 that um, the English version was published of the book um, NATO, oh, what, what was the, the English title? Um, uh, NATO Secret Armies, Operation Gladio and uh, Manipulated Terrorism in Western Europe. Yes, and the German um, version was published in 2008 and it's called NATO Geheimarmeen in Europa, Incineta Terror und Verdeckte Kriegsführung. And he has also written in 2006 a book about the Cuba crisis and uh, the UNO. Uh, UN. Okay, gentlemen, is this um, so far accurate? Yes, from my side, everything is perfect. Okay. Uh, Mike, let us first begin with your book, Crossing the Rubicon. Why have you named this book, Crossing the Rubicon? What is the significance? Well, historically, in 49 BC, Uh, Julius Caesar, uh, who was then one of uh, three, what were they, consuls, proconsuls, the triumvirate in Rome, uh, crossed the Rubicon, which was a, a small river, really a creek, uh, which was defining the borders of Rome itself. And he took the 13th Legion and crossed the Rubicon, which was the cardinal sin in the Roman Republic, which marked the end, the death of the Roman Republic and the birth of the Roman Empire. But historically, the term crossing the Rubicon has, has really meant crossing into a completely new dimension, crossing a turning point from which there is no turning back, uh, making a fateful decision 
that, that determines the course of events uh, historically afterwards, and that is truly in effect. The Rubicon was crossed uh, on September 11th, 2001, with the uh, dramatic um, and draconian uh, evisceration of constitutional protections in the United States of America, and really a total disregard for the rule of law in what I wrote at the time, and has since pretty well been, been proved true, to be a pursuit uh, to control ever-diminishing oil supplies on the planet. And that was it. We crossed the Rubicon. And uh, one, of the, one of the key lines in this book, which is 600 pages, what, that, that I wrote was that the events in the five years following September 11th would de determine the course of human history for the next 500 years. And sadly, I believe that to be true. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ganser, in 2005, you did something with this book and also with the official report, uh, the 9-11 report, you did the comparison. Is this true? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, my work um, um, like some 10 years ago was on NATO's secret army, so that's um, how I was linked to the terrorism debate. And uh, within that research, I, I had found out that in Western Europe, we had stay-behind armies uh, run by NATO. Uh, Operation Gladio in Italy is the key word and that these secret armies were linked to uh, acts of terrorism. And then when 9-11 happened, um, you know, most of my students, uh, I was teaching history at the time, um, came to me and said, can we have a seminar on 9-11, you know, because they were all, you know, reading reports on the Internet about different stories about 9-11. They didn't know which story to believe. And at the time, um, I think it was 2004 or 2005, I felt the need to actually do such a seminar. You know, for some time I said, no, I can't do that yet, or let's wait another year, and let's wait until the Bush administration publishes the official narrative of the event. And this happened in, in, in summer 2004. That was the, the Keen report. Um, and uh, then I took the Keen report, which was the official narrative um, of what happened on 9-11. Um, you know, Osama bin Laden did it, and, and these claims that are, are popular. And I took another book, which was the book that Mike Rupert, who is now connected with us on the phone from California, had written because he obviously had a completely different story on what happened on 9-11. And the students um, had to read both books and make up their mind which one was correct. So that was a very, very interesting um, seminar, which I, I think we did it at Zurich University at the time, and there was yeah. some 20 or 25 students. Yeah, I would have loved uh, to have seen that. <laughs> Uh, Mike, in your book, actually, you have a, a, a own comparison, what you have written about and what is written in the report. Uh, what would you point out uh, is not in the report that you have written about that is of real importance and most people don't pay attention to? We could probably do several hours on that answer, but for me, yeah. the single most significant glaring um, discrepancy is the fact that on the day of September the 11th, uh, Vice President Richard Cheney was in command, personal command, as a result of decisions made in May uh, of 2001 and announced by the White House on its webpage, of five war game exercises, all involving uh, fighter aircraft, uh, largely from the Northeast air defense sector where the attacks occurred. And in the months prior to 9-11, uh, these war games had been scheduled, uh, and, and but what these war games did, Vigilant Guardian, v Vigilant Warrior, Northern Vigilance, there were five, six that I identified. They moved all of the fighters uh, that were available to respond to just such an attack to Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and Iceland in uh, for war game exercises anticipating a Soviet over-the-pole strategic bomber attack, which is... My father flew in interceptors during the Korean War. That was a 50-year-old threat. Uh, and that was in spite of the fact that there were extremely detailed warnings, uh, specific warnings from foreign intelligence services, including Bundesnachrichtendienst, uh, uh, which said that hijacked airliners were going to be crashed into the World Trade Center in the week of September 9th. Some of the warnings had come from Russia, from Israel, all over the world. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, all of the fighters were removed out of the region, and there was another specific war drill, which I identified and obtained on the record uh, admissions to from Air Force officers, from the, uh, NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, 
and other places that had placed during the attacks 22 false radar blips on the radar screens of, uh, of air traffic controllers, making it absolutely impossible to pick out the four hijacked aircraft when there were only something like an estimated eight fighters available to respond and they have to fly in pairs. And it was, in fact, that paralysis of an air, air defense system that had worked flawlessly since the end of the Second World War. I, I know this from my family background. This was how I was raised. Uh, and, and, and rendered that, that very effective system absolutely useless. Uh, and, uh, and at the time also, thanks to a book by Richard Clark, I was able to confirm that the United States was running a live fly hijack drill in which the United States government had an airliner posing as a hijacked airliner on top of everything else. So that's what paralyzed the response. And if the world, and, and, and of course it's too late now, but if, if had the world chosen to address just that one major issue, everything else about uh, the attacks of se September 11th and the U.S. government's version would have come completely unraveled. Uh, uh, why do you think it is too late? Not that I disagree, but why do you think it is too late to raise this? I, I, I made a decision in December of 2004 after the 2004 uh, election, as some call it here, in which George W. Bush was re-elected. And it was very clear to me, I, I was a political science student, and I have a lot of training in that area, that the political will and, and, and the window of opportunity to judicially uh, address September the 11th had vanished. There was not going to be any chance to go back and certainly with the state of the world right now, the resources and the time are, are, are much needed elsewhere. Uh, Dr. Ganza, uh, for what kind of purpose was actually 9-11 uh, uh, used in, in regard to our real topic, resource war? Well, you know, there's two different stories. One story um, is that 9-11 was a surprise attack um, by terrorists hiding in Afghanistan and other places. So. Uh, all that happened after 9-11 was a chase for terrorists and in, in the case you get them and either kill them or put them in, in prison or Guantanamo or everything, everywhere else, uh, then the problem is solved. And that was the story that was spread across the world. But the second story, which obviously um, is um, presented in, in Crossing the Rubicon and, and other um, publications, is that we're, we're, we're looking at a resource scarcity um, uh, in different fields. Uh, in, in the oil area, it's most it's most interesting due to the peak oil discussion uh, and that means that it doesn't you know we don't have actually um, a scramble for terrorists but we have a scramble for oil and gas and you know these two stories are completely um, at odds with each other I mean as if you, if you go out and talk to people some people at least I can speak here uh, for Switzerland some people for, for quite some time uh, believed in in the terrorist story and then came 2001, the Afghanistan war, just a few weeks after 9-11, I think it was three weeks. Uh, and then in 2003, we had the Iraq war um, linked, you know, linked as well um, in, in, in a, you know, very unscientific and manipulative way to 9-11. And, you know, people are all confused what it what it's all about with these wars. And I, I, I strongly believe that we are actually looking at resource wars, but we don't um, dare to actually speak about them in that sense. I mean, most people they pretend that we have enough resources and that the only problem is that there are some terrorists out there with weapons of mass destruction. So this discourse, to my mind, goes on. Uh, Dr. Ganzo, there is a question from me. Do you know about the uh, Great Man Made River project as possible? No. no. It's uh, the biggest uh, water store of the world and it's um, at Libya, Egypt, Chad, and um, last Sudan. but not least, Sudan, right? There is the biggest water reservoir all over the world. Is it possible that that could be uh, the the point why there is no war and not the oil? Well, you know, in the end, you whenever you have a, a conflict, a military conflict between different parties, you will have several interpretations for that for that uh, conflict. 
Um, I, you know, I presume that water is a, is a scarce uh, resource, so it's an important issue that, that, that plays a role. I presume that oil is a scarce and gas is a, a very valuable resource, so we have wars for oil and gas. However, I'm not convinced if we maybe turn to to Libya, um, you know, the, the present war, the most most recent war, which just started a few weeks ago, that there is, um, you know, such a thing as, um, you know, a spreading of democracy into Libya or to Afghanistan or, on, or Iraq. But I, I very much perceive, I mean, I was teaching students two weeks ago um, at Zeppelin University in southern part of Germany at the Bodensee. And then I asked this question, you know, everybody remembers where they were on 9-11. And then one of my students raised her hand was, uh, uh, and, and, and she said, no, I don't remember. And I thought she was kidding because for me and for you and, and for, for my group and everybody else here now collected over the phone call, for us, it's very clear where we were, whether we were at home or at the dentist or uh, meeting meeting a friend or, or cooking, and, and we all remember. And then I asked her because I thought, is she kidding? I said, um, why don't you remember? And then she said, I was 11. I was 11 years old when it happened. And then it just, you know, it just dawned on me that she was one of my students, that she's 21 now, she's a student of, of international history, and that these people, they want to hear from us which version is true, because they, they, they were not there when it happened, or they were not there consciously. So as a historian, for me, it's still, still very important to, um, to report the facts on 9-11 that are available and uh, to, to talk about these resource scarcity that we, that, that we, that we look at today. I'd like to add something quickly to that, if I may. Um, with regard to the motives for September 11th, I have spoken this for years in a number of university lectures and written it, that the deepest, darkest secrets of the attacks of September 11th lie buried within the, the records of the National Energy Policy Development Group, which was a highly secretive energy task force also run by Dick Cheney, which, uh, which violated the American Constitution, fought, fought twice to the Supreme Court to keep the records secret. That's still illegal. Uh, and that, those records will outline the fact that the Bush administration was completely and totally aware of peak oil at the time. And a little bit of records that, that were leaked uh, corroborate um, a conclusion that that, was, that, that, uh, that group, the purpose was strictly to identify the world's oil reserves and find ways to get them. Um, and, 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 and also talk about feeling old. That was a brilliant uh, observation about your student. I still remember where I was when John Kennedy was shot, so I must be getting old. <laughs> no, but if, if I may I, I'm come in here with, with this National Energy Policy Development Group, you know, that's for us uh, also from a historical perspective, it's exactly that one um, group that I was very interested to get more access to because um, clearly these people met months before um, September 11. They met in the, in, in the first months of the Bush administration when they were in office. And that is a completely different narrative. If you now um, presume that they were sitting together and they were talking about peak oil and you know, trying to find a solution to the problem, then we get a completely different narrative than what you heard on mainland Western Europe and what you heard on, on, in continental or in, in the United States. I mean, most people here have never heard of peak oil. In fact, my students, when they read Crossing the Rubicon, they first had to clarify, what is peak oil? Does it mean that all the oil is gone? Then I had to explain to them, no, that's the moment where oil production reaches a maximum. And if and after that, it's, it's going into decline. We, we can be on a, on a bumpy plateau for some years. That's possible. But if you look at the figures, in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, we had six million barrels in the system. You know, that's what we were consuming daily. And in 1970, we were going up to 50 million barrels. And today we are at 87 million barrels per day. So the last 60 years were just an increase of oil production and everybody got used to this. And, and, and it's very prob problem. I, mean, I think my group has really added a very, very important perspective to this international analysis when he said, it's very probable that Dick Cheney was fully aware of the fact that peak oil is coming 
um, that Iraq has maybe the third largest oil reserves after Saudi Arabia and Iran, and that that, that therefore it's very uh, it's a big bounty, you know, that you can seize on it. Um, but that is a discourse that most people are completely unaware of. They don't even know that the National Energy Policy Development Group uh, existed. Uh, Dr. Ganza, one question. Are, are you think that um, governments are really interested in um, clear this problem? Or it's better for the, for the government if uh, oil is rare and so they can um, control the people? I mean, I think it really depends on which government you look at. I think the country that I know best is Switzerland. Uh, you know, I was born here. I, did all my schooling here. I mean, I was traveling across the world, uh, but uh, this is the country I know best. And I can only say that in Switzerland, the population wants to know how much oil there is left and whether the wars that are going on have anything to do with oil. Uh, they want to know what happened on 9-11. So, you know, there's a general interest in these topics. But at the same time, if we as, you know, doctors and professors on a university level dare to touch these subjects, then it can get very, very difficult. I mean, if you look at Europe as a whole, look at the European Union, there has to be some... 300 to 500 professors of history and political science, if you take them together. And now, you know, you would expect this group of outstanding scholars, and many, you know, have had years of training, they've had read hundreds of books and have written themselves a few. You would expect them to take a stand on 9-11 and, and, and make an analysis as far as, uh, you know, it relates to resource wars, but were there, were there is anything like that. And what you do see, and that's that's what I think is very surprising, especially also from Germany, there are a lot of brilliant people in Germany. The Germans are known to, to think sharp, that you actually don't hear anything from a university level, nothing. If you hear anything, if you hear anything at all, and it's usually independent journalists, it's investigative journalists like Mike Rupert, uh, or it's people who, who are retired. I mean, in the United States, we have a professor who, who's well-known, David Ray Griffin, He's but he's retired. You know, he's not active at university anymore. And what my students are really, really surprised uh, about is that they, you know, on YouTube, they get more information there than they get at, at, at university classes. And that has to do with the information revolution that we're, in the midst of, you know, this is the information revolution age where people or students have access to the internet every day, everywhere, and then they go to university and they hope that their professor is going to explain to them how the world works. So they need to address 9-11, they need to address oil, and they need to address the Bush administration and, and other issues. And um, it's very, very frustrating uh, for many of my students that these these topics, 9-11, for instance, is one of the most delicate topics, but also peak oil, are not being addressed right now at university level. Yeah, but the, the big question is who pays for the universities, who pays for the studies, and uh, things like that, I think so. It's, it's not only who pays. Well, that always matters. We know that. It always matters. But it's more peer pressure. Like, um, I, 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 my personal experience was that I was at the ETH, which you know, a, a very prestigious Swiss university, the Federal Institute of, of Technology. And, and I, I was, you know, I stumbled more or less a, across the collapse of WT7, this uh, third building, which collapsed on 9-11 on without that it was hit by, by a plane. I mean, we all know that now. But at the time, it was news for me. And then I told my colleagues, well, we should investigate this. This is, you know, relevant and interesting. Um, and then some of my colleagues told me, if you do that, you, you're never going to, you know, get a full tenureship as a professor, which means, you know, a prestigious position, a lot of money and, and, and you know, um, no worries as to searching for a job for your whole life. And that's really how it works. Most people are scared to lose their job or they're scared to lose their prestige um, if they address certain issues. And I actually think Mike Rupert is not a person like that. You know, he's, he's not scared to lose his job or his prestige. So he's, he just goes and writes books like that that everybody reads but, you know, doesn't dare to talk about the same thing. And that... You know, I'd, I'd like to maybe hear more from Mike, how he handles yeah. this. Well, on this way, I think um, yeah, Mike wait. has has got a painful way to this yeah. point, a painful way. Indeed, I have. and uh, But that's been the price I have paid 
for not being willing or perhaps able to compromise myself uh, because I wasn't willing to sacrifice my own ability to interpret reality. That, 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 that for me was far scarier than what I've suffered as a result of this. But this, this really touches a much deeper point in that the whole, our entire species is guilty here. We have all lived in an infinite growth economic paradigm, and that's what I say clearly in crossing the Rubicon, <clears throat> based upon fractional reserve banking, fiat currency, uh, and compound interest. That requires energy. There can be no growth without energy. That's, that just stands, it, it, it's, it, it's bold-faced evident. Um, and, and we have all been guilty of that. Every politician in the world, and that would include not only elected officials, but I would include university heads, department heads, etc., and, and, and call them politicians as well, has co-signed onto the infinite growth economic paradigm. And it has become <clears throat> psychologically and spiritually a, 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 a sacred cow that most people dare not even question at a fundamental level. One of the wisest men I've ever met, uh, who was an assistant imam uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, he was also an emergency room physician who was the third doctor on the scene on 9-11, and said, a paradigm is what you think about something before you think about it. <laughs> and most people are psychologically and spiritually incapable of questioning infinite growth because that underpins our entire civilization and our entire human paradigm to this point. That's why it's been so difficult for people to, uh, to acknowledge my work and the work of many others. And that has been, I have to admit, particularly painful along the way, uh, simply because my only desire was to help people discuss this so that we could have addressed these problems sooner while there was time to do something about them, and still to realize that we cannot even be seen or acknowledged for the work that we did. Yeah, Mike, uh, could you maybe um, tell us about... Um the Hirsch report. I think this is significant. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, I believe, uh, did um, this um, report on behalf of the U.S. government. This is true. And still he was stonewalled. He was indeed. R uh, Robert Hirsch was, uh, was with a, uh, an American defense intelligence uh, high-tech firm called SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation. Uh, and and they were commissioned, so that's that that's hardly a, 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 an entity that one would expect to uh, raise alarm like this. But they did. Uh, the Hirsch report, released in 2005, uh, dealt with three specific scenarios <clears throat> regarding uh, mankind's uh, decision to take action about peak oil. In the first scenario, 20 years. Even then, had had we started 20 years before peak. Uh, the dislocations would have been devastating. At 10 years, they were catastrophic. And waiting until the last minute to address peak oil, the Hirsch report concluded, basically condemned all of human and industrial civilization to extinction. And that, in fact, is exactly what is happening right now. We waited too long, and there is no fix. Now, when we live in a world with 1.4, 1.5 quadrillion U.S. dollars in derivatives, a bubble, uh, that's uh, that's imploding, and 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 Japan has thrown that into overdrive, and we live in a world where it is now admitted that we are five years past the peak of global oil production. That's significant because there's a 96% correlation between GDP growth and greenhouse gas emission, i.e., the burning of oil, which we use for 90% of all transportation. And all of these bailouts are never possibly going to be repaid now because there is no energy to fund that growth. Not, not, yeah. not only no energy, we're running out of all kinds of resources at the same time. Uh, one more question. Uh, are you aware that the U.S. pays this year over $400 billion for just on interest on the debt? Yes, and we are, you know, we, we are... There is, among economists, there is a, a, a universally accepted place where, where debt, government debt at 90% of GDP is a point of no return, and that's exactly where the U.S. is now. Britain, I think, is just a little past that. The Japanese government is at 200% debt to GDP. That's, there is no comeback from that. 
so um, it, it is clear that the U.S. economy is cooked, and the, and, and the recent budget cuts that the American Congress has talked about are an insignificant drop in the bucket. Uh, day by day, uh, not only the U.S. government, but I think every government in the world, as long as it adheres to the infinite growth paradigm and the promise of recovery, is looking more and more not credible and even ludicrous. Yeah. And what uh, are your thoughts uh, related to the war in Libya? Isn't this maybe something like um, like a duel or, or a confrontation um, between Uh, the West on the one side, or part of the West, and Russia and China on the other, because Mr. Gaddafi wanted to give them the oil contract? No, I actually, I think that every industrialized nation in the world, let's take the G8, uh, kind of supports the Libyan action, which is really wag the dog, and it is also serving another useful purpose now, which is distraction from the uh, c catastrophe in Japan, which is still the biggest story in the world. But the, the point about Libya is this. We are using 87 million barrels per day. That's correct, which is higher demand than we had at, at the previous peak of demand in 2007. Yet we passed peak oil, according to the IEA and everybody now, at, in, in, in 2006. So the oil price is uh, – oil is a fungible. Uh, its price is now it, – it's elastic globally. So, uh, so a shortage of oil impacts prices everywhere. And the IMF, the World Bank, uh, many other uh, think tanks have said clearly that it's obvious that, that high oil prices kill economic growth and, and, as we saw in 2008, kill economic activity. So the, the motive in Libya is to keep their 1.5 million barrels a day of light sweet on the market because if you take 1.5 million barrels per day out of the market, we see oil price spikes that are, 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 are so hard, at, at, and it's happening right now, that they shut down economic activity. So that's, but Libya is, is, is just, it's just a disgusting sideshow that really shows even the conceptual ineptitude of uh, world leadership right now. So you would say the world leadership has really no interest in uh, preventing a Great Depression? The, the world, world leadership is powerless to prevent a Great Depression. <laughs> to prevent this. Uh, and yeah. yet that's what they fail to realize. They are literally rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, and they will keep doing these... Uh, these dog and pony shows as long as there is one railing above the waterline. So so maybe um, we we'll have to end our wars because we have no energy to fight them? Oh, th that's, that's far too logical. <laughs> that's far too sane. <laughs> our political system doesn't work that way. We are, in fact, competing on, on, in various dimensions over diminishing resources everywhere, whether it be oil, coal. Food now is probably uh, as important as oil. Uh, food shortages are appearing all over the world, and the UN released a report earlier this year saying that without uh, a massive bumper harvest globally this year, we would be looking at 1.1 billion people uh, uh, starving. That's a lot of people. And, of course, we see the evidence of that in food riots that are taking place, not only in the Middle East and North Africa, but in, in India, in Southern Africa, and uh, one could argue well in other parts of the industrialized world as well. And that's only going to get worse. So we're short of everything, and, and we've chosen to fight for it because the economic paradigm dictates that there is more money to be made by destroying things than there is by saving them. Um, Mike? Are you seeing that the USA raised to a perfect police state to defend the rich and beautiful against the folk? <laughs> I'm saying that the United States, as, as I knew it as a child, no longer exists. Uh, I am saying that uh, the, uh, the government in Washington, D.C. is a government of the banks, by the banks, and for the banks, uh, and that the American political system is completely broken. Broken or corrupted? Both. And uh, what do you think uh, for 2012? The, the ra horse race begins now for the Republican Party? 
I, I would be surprised at this point uh, if our government functions the way it has functioned uh, in, in, in 2012. The, the, uh, the uh, going, we're not going off the, the, the so-called bumpy plateau of peak oil and down the cliff uh, back, back to some kind of uh, entropic uh, stasis wherever the rubble is going to land. Uh, and, and that cannot be prevented. Um, and we are looking at uh, not only a failure of the major markets around the world when the first quarterly reports come in for a full quarter after Fukushima, as the global supply system breaks down, we're looking at the complete failure of government. So uh, it, it's very difficult for me to, to, to even envision what the political landscape is going to look like in 2012. We have to get through this year first. Uh, Dr. Ganza, what do you, what do you say uh, or think um, related to the food crisis? Well, you know, generally these, this discussion about collapse and sustainability and collapse and sustainability and collapse and sustainability, I mean, that, that is a huge, huge issue. And um, it is, it has been said that the unrest that we're seeing in, 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 that we've seen in Egypt, that we've seen in Tunisia, that we've seen in Bahrain has to do um, with uh, raising food prices as well. Uh, we, we obviously have 24,000 people um, who die every day from, from starvation. That's a lot, 24,000. I've always said to my students that I think this is maybe the most astonishing figure available you know there's so many figures available on, on the state of the world but if you think of of a, of, of a professor teaching to to you know rather rich kids in switzerland how the world works they, they are all completely surprised that so many people die and um, just because they don't have enough drinking water and uh, they don't have enough food and then we talk about the mechanisms that actually um, lead to this situation. It obviously has to do a lot with the, that food prices uh, are rising and that some people are just outpriced, which means um, the food is actually there, but those who need it um, the most can't pay for it. It's as if you go into a supermarket and you can see the food, but it's just too high for you to reach, and, and it's up there, and, and you don't have the purchasing power to get to it. And, if we if we think of of the peak God problem, we I mean you know there's disagreement on when exactly it happens. Uh, I, I, I maybe have not exactly the same interpretation as my group, but we have similar perspectives. I'm, I'm saying that you know conventional oil has reached a peak at at 70 million barrels a day, as the International Energy Agency confirmed now after you know a long delay. But then if you look at the newest report of the International Energy Agency, they say yes, we're at 87 million barrels today today but we can go to I don't know first they said to 120 which which was nonsense then they said no we can only go to 105 and then then they said we can go to 99 and they you know they put a lot of a lot of, a lot of emphasis on this non-conventional oil they they said we're going to get a lot of out of the oil sands no dirt and we're going to we're going to go deep water drilling and everything else but let's assume we're not going to go much higher than 90 or maybe 95, taking all the oil we want. Then the food prices, as, as my group would rightly said, and as you point out, the food prices can only go one way, which is up. You know, when the oil is scarce and we need a lot of oil to produce our food, then the price of the food go up. And the purchasing power of the poorest 2 billion people on the planet is very, very low. So how are they going to buy their food? And then, you know, you, you add the water. It's, it's, uh, but I, I just wanted to add, it was a very important point, an excellent discussion, that there are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy in every calorie of food consumed in the industrialized world. That's because oil-powered machines plow, harvest, etc., but we also generate electricity. All fertilizers are made from natural gas, the commercial fertilizers, and all pesticides are made from petroleum. So. It's, it's, it's axiomatic that as oil prices spike, the food prices must follow. Uh, one, one, one more point. Uh, there is the competition between food and um, energy. And there is the point of peak phosphor. You know mm. it? Mm. Yeah. I mean, to my mind, what is very important when I work with my students, you know, you have to keep in mind there are 20, 25, some of some are 30, you know, if they take a little longer for their studies. But um, these people are at the beginning of their life, okay? They want to go out there. They want to do something which makes sense. They want to found a family, build a house, do all the things that everybody does. 
And to them, I want to say, you know, we're looking at tremendous changes. That's actually what I want to, to tell them. I don't want to say um, the world is going to, you know, go down and, and, and be completely destroyed within 20 years. But I'd rather say that it's important right now that we make up our mind where we want to go. And it's actually we this generation or maybe the next one, but maybe this uh, already, um, has to make up its mind whether it wants to go maybe through some sort of consciousness shift where we acknowledge that we cannot just use material that is limited and burn it and, and pretend that this is a sustainable system. And that is really a consciousness shift. I, I always take a very, very simple example. Uh, in Switzerland, we introduced the voting rights uh, for women only in um, 1971. It's a shame, you know, I know uh, it's, it's <laughs> it was very late. But if I look at the debate that we had in Switzerland in the 1915s, then the men said, oh, you know, we can't give women the voting right. I mean, the country would go down and everything would be destroyed. They, 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 you know, they can't be trusted. We can't give them the voting right. And then after 1971, uh, women received the voting right in Switzerland. They're obviously now represented in parliament and even, you know, in our government. More, we have more ministers who are women than men right now. But um, it was a, a change of consciousness. You know, something happened that before people thought would be first impossible and second stupid. And now when we look back, I mean, it's only a very, very small example. We're a little bit ashamed that the shift of consciousness took so long. And if I look at the peak oil debate, at all the scarcity problems, at a terrorism debate on 9-11 and the ongoing wars in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and elsewhere, I see again the same consciousness shift that is necessary. We must stop to pretend that we can only solve problems with violence. We, we got so used to this habit that we always say, well, we, you know, we can't do anything else than bomb. But it's not true. We can do other, other things. And it's not the only way to get energy uh, to, to burn coal, gas, and oil. It's not the only way. So I'm really interested in this shift. I'm not sure whether it's going to happen, but it's, it's always possible. <laughs> I don't know how you guys think about it, but that's that's something I watch as a historian and I take notes. <laughs> I don't yeah, know where we will be in 10 years. I think as this is a... Historian, you should know that, for example, in the USA, they are talking about energy independency since the days of Richard Nixon and nothing has been done. Is this correct, Mike? Absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, uh, in, in, in my new home here, I have a letter on the wall from former President Jimmy Carter, who's read my latest book and thanked me. And, of course, Jimmy Carter was a true prophet on that when it comes to the American people, but the world was not ready to hear his message then. Uh, uh, do you think that, uh, in general, the, um, the change of consciousness is uh, growing rapidly and rapidly yeah, enough? I, oh, yes. Uh, okay. This is, this is like an amazing moment. Let me fall back, and, and first of all, Dr. Ganzi, you're brilliant. Thank you. It's so good to be in a conversation with a sentient being. Thank you. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Colin Campbell, who is, I guess, recognized by many as the godfather, if you will, of the peak oil movement now. He oh, yes, he is. Yeah, he definitely is. And, 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 and I remember a, a statement he made to me in early 2002. He said the species Homo sapiens might not become extinct, but the subspecies of petroleum man most certainly will. <laughs> the change of consciousness is absolutely what is in front of us. One of my trademark lines, and it was in the movie Collapse, is that the human race is being faced with a, a, a decision, either evolve or perish, grow up or die. And, and there is a change of, of consciousness, which is, and this evolution is purely internal, if you will, psychological something, spiritual. Um, the species of post-petroleum man is emerging, uh, and, and, and I know this because of my current venture, Collapse Net, which we started after the movie. We opened less than a year ago, and we're now in 61 countries. Uh, and we're growing now at about 15 to 20 percent per month as world events continue to fall solidly on this map that we made. And what we find, thank you also to Facebook, uh, the movie was pirated two million times, but I have tens of thousands of Facebook friends, or about, uh, excuse me, about 8,000. But uh, uh, there is clearly a, a mass of humanity around the world, regardless of where they live, that has a consciousness that, that, that grasps that the current 
uh, paradigm of human industrial civilization is not only dying, but it is deadly and lethal. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really pleased. Uh, every day I get messages from around the world from many people, and that's what keeps me going because this change is taking place. Not un unfortunately, not in our governments or our financial institutions. Oh. But, but, but I, 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 yeah. Can I come in on that? I think this yeah, is a very on. interesting point because I have so many young people who are coming around and they, they, they basically understand you know, that we're being lied to about war and terrorism. They understand that. They've been on the internet for such a long time that they know that they're being lied to. Then the second step they go is that they understand that resources are limited and that, that peak oil is a real challenge for them. They don't know whether it's now or in 10 years, but they know it's within their lifetime and it's, it's close. But what they lack, it really, or what I feel they lack, is um, a vision of, of, of some potential positive development. I mean, and, and if, I, if I understand my group correctly, he's really saying the word collapse means, uh, it refers to the, to the old paradigm. The old paradigm is dying, sort of, you know, bomb the others, lie to the rest, and grab the oil. I mean, that's the old paradigm. It probably is dying because it's not a long-term solution for our problems. And, and the collapse does not mean that the entire uh, human um, species will collapse in, in the sense of, I'm just drastically putting it, everybody's dying, but I'm saying that some people evolve, change their, their, their way of thinking, change their way of feeling, and, and somehow move into a different consciousness. Is that correct? Mike, do I understand you correctly? That is absolutely correct. Although I would add a correction in that Fukushima in Japan has taught us one lesson, which is that we are all susceptible, and there are, I, I don't know the exact number, but there are several thousand nuclear reactors in the world, and as, as industrial civilization collapses, these all must be shut down with, with a cold shutdown. It's 440 nuclear reactors. And we could poison ourselves with radiation or environmental disaster, or in a worst-case scenario, we could just go to nuclear war over resources, which is not out of the realm of possibility now, uh, and end everything that way. So, the, you know, the, the stakes are about as high as they can get. Mm -hmm. it's, it's 440 nuclear reactors. It's 17 in Germany and 5 in Switzerland, 100 in the U.S. and, and some 50 in France and some 50 in Japan. Yeah, and the debate, I mean, when I look at the nuclear debate in Switzerland, maybe that's something else I'd like to add to this international conversation because I think that's the brilliant thing about this conversation. It's an international conversation. We link, you know, different uh, consciousness and, uh, across the globe. And I can just tell you that in Switzerland, we planned to vote in one year on whether we're going to have two nuclear power plants. And the majority of the political parties were saying, yes, we need two new nuclear power plants because otherwise we don't have enough electricity. And if we don't have enough electricity, we cannot grow our economy. So this growth paradigm was there. And so we really need this. And some parties, like the Green Party and the Socialist Party, said, no, no, we don't want nuclear power. It's too dangerous. And after Fukushima, um, we are having a completely new discourse in Switzerland. The debate whether we're going to build new nuclear power plants is out. It's not here anymore. It's either postponed to like 10 or 20 years down the road, or it's not ever coming back. And people are debating how quickly we're going to shut down the five nuclear power plants that we have. So what I mean with this small example is that um, what, what, what was true three months ago can can have, can cannot be can, can change very quickly in three months down the road if you have international events that have a strong impact and I I, I have this feeling that that similar things could happen uh, with that fiat currency you know with the with the with the money system it's still you know we're very strong we're linked to our to our dollars or Swiss francs or, or, or euros that we have and I'm not sure what 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 is going to happen in the next ten years on on that field but that as well can can lead can lead to very very strong changes. Obviously, I'm just a historian. You know, I'm, I'm going to write it down how people react, and I don't know what will happen in the next ten years. But I think it's incredibly and amazing the changes that are going on. Yeah. Uh, but related to money, uh, Mike, I would like to ask you one thing. 
you were one of the first ones where I have written, uh, where I have read something about the rigging of the gold market. Um, yes. Do you have the feeling that this becomes now a mainstream story? I think it becomes uh, a story passé, um, in that it is clear that all, and, and, and there have been very, very serious and well-documented efforts, and I salute the Gold Antitrust Action Committee and Bill Murphy for that, which have documented, uh, uh, if you will, uh, godlike efforts to manipulate and control, suppress the gold price over the years. I think that's impossible to do. And again, this all goes back to Fukushima and its effect uh, on the world. Fukushima is a mortal blow to all of human industrialized civilization. It is a mortal blow. Japan is one third, excuse me, the third largest economy in the world, but it is, thanks to globalization, an essential component in every nation's economy. We have seen, and I have been documenting on our world news desk at CollapseNet, the, uh, the s supply chain disruptions that are causing Ford, General Motors, uh, Siemens, I, I, I saw a warning and earnings report on. I mean, major Texas Instruments now, because they cannot get key components, microcircuits, chips, et cetera, from Japan, and Japan is the only place that makes them. Now, and that's just one issue. Ford has shut down uh, 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 some some paint lines because they can't get the, the, uh, a specific pigment that was only obtainable in Japan. Japan is is a vital organ in in human industrial civilization, which functions as one body, and that vital organ is still bleeding from a gushing wound which has not been controlled. That organ is going to fail. Japan is dead. And, and, and no body can, no, no human body can afford to lose a vital organ like lungs, heart, et cetera, liver, uh, and, and expect to survive. So J Japan has changed everything. Um, a question to the, to the last topics, or also all topics, there um, is a point where I will quote Obama. We need a change. We have to make a decision. And first point must be a change of our mind, I think so. The solution must be a peaceful coexistence and also share the fruits of the years. And use it wise, isn't it? Oh, I certainly fully agree that, that the peaceful coexistence is, is one of the important factors. I mean, we still... You know, we're growing very quickly as a world population. It's 80 million people, that's one Germany, that we add every year on top of the globe. So we're growing very quickly as, as a human family, if you want to put it that way. And if we, and we, at the other hand, we're highly armed. You know, we have sophisticated weapons and we're fully aware of that. And uh, we have diminishing resources. So just these three observations must lead everybody to the conclusion that we can either create chaos, and we're very good at that, or we can start to find some new order, because we all long to have, we all love order, nobody loves chaos, but the order that we've had, you know, the order of the past, I think, is really collapsing, as Mike Rupert puts it in, in, in his writings, as I understand. And um, I, I'm, I'm very interested whether we're able to establish a new order which is more peaceful. Um, I hope I hope that we can, but I think it's it's going to be quite a change, you know, we, because we have to overcome our fears of um, yeah fears of losing your job, fears of, of of not being respected by your peers. I've just seen these emotions as being very very influential, and we don't usually talk about them. Uh, we don't usually talk about emotions that uh, like fear and greed, which have a lot to do with the Iraq War, which have a lot to do with 9/11, and we we talk about you know tech, technical issues like why did WT7 collapse or, or what was what was the point with the the stand down of the air defense system, and 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 I think if we if we carry the discourse one step further, we will have to to talk about why we're stuck in these um, uh, negative emotions that like greed and fear, they, they're huge and, and they they destroy us, I think. Unless we change. I'm not sure. Maybe we change. They, yeah, they use could, every... Could you talk, 
I could too, could you talk a bit about fear and uh, the fi uh, famous quote you use uh, from June? Oh yeah, I I I don't remember the quote exactly, but let me go back for a second. I have said clearly for a decade over and over again that until you change the way money works, you change nothing because money actually governs our relationship for the world and one cannot eat money. It is only a symbol as the printing presses have proved to every nation in the world uh, in the last three years. Um, and fear is something from a spiritual standpoint. I'll have to paraphrase uh, Frank Herbert from Dune with this. But the essential way that all uh, spiritual beings and, and all, I would argue, mature beings uh, approach fear is, is, is to approach it, is to walk toward it rather than away from it, to embrace it rather than to run from it, to confront it. Uh, and that's what the, the only way out is through. Um, and uh, we have been conditioned to believe that it is the infinite growth monetary paradigm which gives us life. No, it is the infinite monetary gro the, the infinite growth paradigm which is killing us. Um, that's the first step, really, to the liberation, to, 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 to finding yourself free to embrace all this stuff, which is very, very frightening and alarming. S some people say fear is false evidence appearing real. Uh, others say it is uh, 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 a, a, a cuss word, everything, and run. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but we say also that fear is face everything and recover. Uh, and this is where the birth of, of, of a new human species will occur, which is among the people who are willing to walk toward and embrace the changes that are now upon us. I'd, I'd just like to, to come in here because I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in what, what my group just said. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's terrific, this conversation, because Mike and I, we've never met, as far as I can recall, <laughs> uh, but he, and he's far away. Yeah, and he's on the other side of the Atlantic, and, and we're not the same age group. I was born in 72, you were born in 51, I'm here, so it's 20 years between us, two, one generation, and, and, and really Switzerland is not the same like U.S., and, you know, but on the most important points, we agree. Like, we don't agree on all the details, and that's normal with, with, with grown-up people who, who read a lot and, and think a lot, but on the very important points, we agree, because I have this same analysis of fear that... You know, somebody asks me and say, says, you know, how could you um, uh, bear to, to write in the, about the questions about 9-11 in the Swiss press? And, you know, the U.S. Embassy was reacting and everybody. And, and then I say, you know, I dealt with my fear. And in a sense, I, I realized that it's there. I don't, I don't pretend that I don't have fears. Of course I have fears. But then I did, some maybe unconsciously, exactly what, what Mike said. He said... Uh, walk towards your fear, embrace it, and, and then go through it, and suddenly find yourself on the other side of the room or, or, or off the wall or whatever. And, and that's what I did, and it really worked. I mean, it really worked. So well, if, if this phone um, conversation and, and your radio show ha can have an impact on, on listeners, then my, a really important point I would like to make or to emphasize is that first, yes, we have very serious challenges uh, on, on the analytical level, like, you know, understand what happened on 9-11, where, where peak oil is, what's going on in Libya, how much food we have left, uh, how many people we are on the planet, all these things, the growth paradigm, or, or even the fi financial system is highly complex. So on the, on the elliptical side, we, we, that can keep us busy for a long time. But if we, if we move to the other side as well, on the emotional level, which is, which is really dominant, it's really strong in, every, in, in each of us, that there we, we all maybe try to look at our fears, uh, embrace them, and, and go through it. I mean, I'm not saying it's working for everybody, but I can say it worked for me. And next time I have my fears, I always do the same. I always try to do it again. Because ne I've never had fear being a good advisor uh, to me and helping me out if I have problems. It, it really has never been the case. It's usually been good to, to, to face the, the problems that are all there, out there. And I just realized with my students that some of them say, yeah, but gee, if that's all true, then, then, then we're really in a mess. And I say, yeah, uh, on the one hand, that's true. We are in a very delicate situation, but it doesn't help us if we ignore it. It'd be good if we, if we look at, at the challenges that are here 
and then move beyond, move beyond, because it's there's no, you know, there's no law that says we have to do things exactly the same way that we did them in the 20th century, including the Second World War, where we just killed each other. I mean, wh why should we do? Why we should, should we do the things in the 21st century exactly the same way that we've done them in the, in the 20th century? Because if, if there's one consensus, it really is the 20th century didn't work. It didn't work. We had progress on different levels, but we killed each other on a much too intensive way. So I hope we can, we can move beyond that. I'm not sure whether we can, but I have a hope. Yeah, maybe we can. But uh, is not the, the biggest problem that the people everywhere uh, love their so-called sunny side of life and they they take the same lies every time i think that is the biggest problem that the people don't thought about the the, the lies from the past yeah. that they take uh, things for granted and that we all live in this best uh, uh, scenario way I mean, if I, if I can, or do you want Mike Rupert? Do you want to comment? So yeah, just just very briefly, let's go back for a bit to to this change in consciousness and the walking through the fear thing. I am now in Northern California, becoming sustainable, living in very close harmony with the land, changing both my lifestyle and my values. Locally grown food production. There's a strong, enlightened, if you will, city state emerging here in Sonoma County, and. What I find is that living a life that I should have been living as a human being all along is infinitely more satisfying than the life I was living before when I thought I was happy. I mean, we have in this, um, you know, the Association for the Study of Pico, obviously Colin Campbell, um, who's been mentioned in the radio show before, uh, he, he's published... Um, um, on the topic of how you know how differently we could we could actually organize ourselves and and, and maybe something similar I'm not sure whether it's the same that Mike Rupert mentioned but similar things are happening in in Great Britain with these transition towns where people actually use local food so it's not food that has been shipped around the world they use wisdoms across generations so it's not the the elderly locked up in one space and nobody wants to talk to them and hopes that they die soon but it's rather let's go to them talk to them how did you do things in the 1930s you know i wasn't here how did you do it and how did you uh, solve issues and and then uh, talk uh, also uh, uh, among groups and and accumulate knowledge and, and i think this is this, there's so many things happening on the planet right now. It's not in the big news because it's not the war in Libya uh, and it's not quantitative easing of, of, of Bernanke, but it's, it's also happening. And um, uh, I think the, the really good thing about the information revolution is that we have these parallel systems of information. Um, my group had mentioned Facebook, that he's connected with all these people through Facebook and other people left just their internet pages. But I think mainstream media is just missing out completely on this, on this, on this shift of consciousness. I think they'll be the last two to report it. But it's out there and it's being it somehow has its traces. Uh, it's, it's, I'm just talking as a historian. You know, I, I sometimes think, had I been born in 1789, I would have been blown away by the changes in France with the, with, with the, with the French Revolution, seeing the king, you know, wane away and the democracy coming. Or, you know, it could have been in America, the same thing. I would have been really uh, impressed. But if I go now to the year 2011, and I'm a 40-year-old Swiss historian who's looking at how the world changes, I'm saying this is 10 times bigger or 100 times bigger, and I'm in the midst of it. I'm just taking notes. Oh, this happened, that happened, and now this shifts like this and that. It's incredible. It's much bigger than the French Revolution. And I have no clue how it will end, but I, I just think that it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, the, one, one question. The, uh, you called it uh, the information revolution, but I think there is a disinformation revolution too. If uh, five, six, seven years ago there was a 
information revolution, but uh, secret services and uh, like this um, see this point and work hard on it. And there are a lot of freaks in the net where publishing trash, a lot of trash. And so oh, yeah. it's really oh, yeah. difficult to find the good information, I think so. And it's more difficult than a lot well, five, six, seven years ago. Today, yes. you can, it, there are thousands of blogs and uh, 980 from them are bullshit, I think. So. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it brings us back to the question, whom do you trust? Whom do you trust? And that is, now you have so many different sources available that you can actually place your trust, you know, according to your choice. You can check this source, you can check that source. And yeah, but you need to... Your money. You, you need a really good feeling for this. And uh, if you don't have the right informations, you, you have to trust by your same uh, own feeling, I think so. Yeah, but that's the thing. That, but that's a crucial point. You have to, to go back to your emotions and, and really, you know, ask your inner side, whom can you trust? And yeah. many people I've, I've talked to, you know, they have not studied 9-11, not at all. These were more women than men. They, they didn't read any books about it. They, they tell me, Ah, oh, it's interesting. You spend five or ten years reading books about it, and and you come to the conclusion that we've been lied to by the Bush administration. I had the same feeling in the beginning. Yeah, but you, they, you need a, a long or a, a lot of time to walk the wrong ways, and uh, yeah, um, some do, but others have a very very quick, intuitive feeling whom they can trust, and then they go with these people. And if if and, and, and the, the really important thing is that like 20 years ago, the information structure at a Swiss university was like that. The professor um, invited the students to come to school and he gave them the book which they had to read. Now the book was a book that he had written himself or a colleague. So, you know, his, his advantage in knowledge was huge. You know, the students could just repeat the knowledge that the professor had had for years. Now, you know, now go to the year 2011, you can take an American university, a German university, a Swiss university, it's all the same. The professor comes into the class and all the students are there with their laptops open. We are okay. on the same way. Um, you have yeah. the choice, but you need a lot of time. I only want to mark the point that that is not only an information revolu a revolution, it's a disinformation revolution too. That's yeah, only the know, point. It's, it's big chaos. That's true. It's yeah, big but chaos. Wait. Mike, Mike can give us a very good example. Mike, uh, very soon after 9-11, the Pentagon um, opened up a disinformation center. Is this true? Yes, it is. So did the State Department as well. That, that was around 2003 that the State Department put out their own page. Yeah, but, but the Pentagon, uh, I think they um, employed uh, 10,000 people just to Something like that. And, and they had an enormous amount of resources yes yeah but how do you um uh, yeah w w w what is your gut feeling when you receive information well I, I, this has been a fabulous discussion but for me what i heard was that we kind of glossed over a very important fundamental shift that has to do with this change in consciousness which is how we know things how we decide that something is true or untrue. We, we are living in a paradigm that has been uh, unfortunately tyrannized by Cartesian logic, ones and zeros, that everything can be measured, controlled, etc. And of course, that was, they've kind of missed a few key things along the way. And, and, and I, I think a great many people are becoming very dissatisfied with uh, Cartesian thinking, with, with, with the logical uh, consumption, absorption, digestion, and processing of data on strictly an intellectual level. The word feeling was used many times, and this is part of what I see happening with this change in consciousness, is that people who are walking toward and through their fear emerge with a gut sense that tells them whether something is right or wrong, and that is leading a lot of people uh, right now to make very, uh, very strong and, and healthy choices. What was discussed about England, if you will, people going back and living uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a clear relationship with their environment is happening all over the world. And that's why CollapseNet.com, my company, is, is in 61 countries. But what's being manifested is that people are relocalizing on all fronts, not just for food production, which is important, but also 
for 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 knowledge and 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 for wisdom that's applicable in their own lives. And that's a big consciousness shift that that has less to do with how much data one can get from the internet and more to do with just human beings learning how to live the way we live for the first 30,000 years of our existence. Human industrial civilization is a blip on the radar. We don't need to learn how to live with nature. We need to remember how to live with nature because that's the way we're programmed, and that's actually very comforting. Gentlemen, I have found out the, um, the actual quote from June. Uh, should I read it? Sure. Okay, it goes. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone, passed, I will turn the inner eye to see it, its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Yeah. That's a quote from Mike Rupert? No, no this is from June. Oh, okay. From, from Frank Herbert, who wrote the book Dune, yeah. Oh, I didn't know the quote, but I mean, I think there was a fascinating, fascinating conversation because the, we are really interdependent, independent people. Like we haven't met, you know, that has to be stressed. I'm here at the Lake of Lugano in Switzerland. It's a beautiful little place on the planet, and, and Mike is over there in in California, I understand. And Lars Charles, we've never met, you know, but it's 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 interesting that we share. Um, insights and we come to similar conclusions and I bet you know if us three or four you know there's going to be thousands of us who are just not on the phone right now but they're all over the place and if, if we or millions millions yeah so if we, we if we start to understand that mainstream evening news is not the full picture and uh, do our little uh, job wherever we are I think yeah then it's as well as possible. We have the we we have innately, I believe, all of the the abilities we need to survive. Not all seven billion of us. That's not possible. But to survive as a species. Uh, but I think uh, it, the the issue is now deprogramming, creating distance, and removing ourselves from the things that we've been programmed to believe that keep us from accessing those most valuable survival uh, knowledges and wisdom. Yeah, and I, I have the feeling, you know, I'm teaching at Basel University. It's the oldest university in Switzerland. It's 550 years old. So it's among the oldest universities of, of Europe. And I just have that feeling that in very old structures um, as Basel University, we have, you know, we have very good people, very, very decent people, very clever people. But it's especially difficult if you're in a very, very old structure like universities, like I mean, Harvard, Yale, everybody else there. It's very hard for them to move. It's very hard. I think it's easier for, for, for people who are 20 years old and, and just live out in, a, in, in, in nature. <laughs> it's just easier for them. And, and, and that's, that's something I just feel very strongly. When the Cambrian extinction came along, the dinosaurs couldn't do anything but react like dinosaurs. They did not. They were not adaptive enough to change, and they went extinct. This is how evolution works, and I and and I argue very clearly that uh, our current governmental and political and financial systems are all dinosaurs, and they can't do anything but do what they've done for the course of their existence. And it is more profitable now to kill things than it is to save them. So they will continue to act like dinosaurs, but. Uh, we 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 can see them cracking, falling, and and uh, and uh, uh, failing right in front of us. Some people uh, try to play the role of God, I think so, but they have to learn. Humans will live together or die together. Mm. That was that was nice. I like that. <laughs> Mike, Mike, we come slowly but surely to the end. Uh, what would you? Um, what kind of advice would you give to our listeners for the future? How to more prepare? Than any, more than anything else, your survival in the future will be determined by your relationship with what is local to where you live. Food production is the single most important element of that. Localized food production, we cannot ship with oil prices where they are and, 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 and all the other problems, we cannot ship food thousands of kilometers 
to feed people. You will have to grow your food where you live, and 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 everything that you will be you will be forced to look to will will be within 50, 100 miles or 100 kilometers of where you live, uh, because we will be limited to that. And to to the degree that people anywhere in the world can relocalize every aspect of their lives, they will have a much better chance of surviving the challenges that are coming. Um. My main points really um, to sum up are within the field of, of war and terrorism to understand that we're being lied to much too often. You know, if, if, if anybody has the time, just pick one example and study one example in depth, get more, a lot of information on how the Iraq war started or get a lot of information on 9-11 or, or, or take Vietnam War, Gulf of Tonkin if you want. And once you've understood that violence is very often accompanied by a lot of propaganda that presents violence as the only and cleverest solution to a given situation, um, I think we, sh we should overcome this, this, this disbelief. That is something that is very crucial in, in, in my research. And the second thing, um, you know, familiarize yourself with peak oil. If you've never heard about it, you heard about it maybe today in the first first time in this radio show, then I think it's an important issue to, to look up. And the third thing, uh, which I thought was very, very interesting in this debate, and so I'm very thankful for, for this exchange of thoughts, was, 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 the, was the point with fear, you know, that we should actually, if we're scared of things, then that, that's normal. And if we think uh, some things are really difficult, that's also normal. But we should walk through it or across it or through it or embrace it and, and just go go to the other side because we're being pushed around uh, because people use our fears, the fear that we lose our job, fear that we're not being loved, fear that terrorists will attack us, fear that all the oil is gone or fear that you know everybody lies to us. And if we get stuck in this way, then it's the very same situation as if somebody in Switzerland wants to start snowboarding and you show him um, a film, a documentary film with, with skull fractures first. I mean, then he's never going to be able to snowboard. You should never watch a film with skull fractures first and then try to learn snowboard. You're not going to learn it. So you, you have to move without fear through your life. Just be courageous. That's, that's my main point. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, uh, with regard to fear, uh, Dr. Ganza, you have written about the so-called strategy of tension. Could you oh, yeah. talk a bit about this? Yeah, that's a last little thing. You know, I'm just saying, in, in, in my PhD research, I worked on Operation Gladio and NATO secret armies and all, all that thing. And, and, and that's when, where I encountered that sometimes terrorist attacks are um, carried out by uh, secret services and then blamed on the political opponent and the entire country is in fear, and people are shocked. And if they're shocked, they lose most of their power. You know, they cannot, you know, go out of the house after six o'clock in the evening, and they don't vote the way they would vote, and they don't say the things that they would say. So I'm, I'm just it cripples an entire society. And I, and I looked at this in detail with the, with the data available from Italy, and, and obviously we've had terrorism in Europe after, you know, 1969, we've had a large terrorist attack, and then, then, and then again in the 80s in, in Bologna, and 1969 was in, in Milano, Piazza Fontana. And so, you know, it's an old story. The, the strategy of tension works. Uh, it has been carried out, but it's, I hope, part of that old paradigm that my group will, cause, uh, will collapse. I, I hope it will collapse. I mean, I have no sympathy with it forever, whatsoever. It's it's uh, it's basically a paradigm that was used to control people. So you know it, it derived from from this fear uh, of 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 people within NATO that they wanted to control um, Western European countries who had a lot of communists in them and they didn't want them uh, to get access uh, to power in Italy, executive positions like defense minister, etc. So we can reconstruct that as historians, and uh, I think we you know. We shouldn't repeat that. It was not. It was not good. Uh, to the, to your point about the fear, uh, I think fear is a bad mentor, and there is a quote: "God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference." That prayer was written by Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr, a German Lutheran minister in the 1930s. Uh, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Great prayer. Yes, okay, yeah. so it's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but maybe 
Uh, Mike, you have actually German German roots. Is this true? Yes. Yes. Uh, my 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 uh, my great grandfather came from a town called Rupertsburg, outside of Heidelberg. Uh, yeah. And uh, in in the in the 1890s, he opened a restaurant across the street from the White House in Washington D.C. But uh, I was raised on Sauerbraten Kartoffelklebe. <laughs> But, but your father was also a World War II hero. Yes, uh, my 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 father was a gunner in uh, in B-17 bombers uh, stationed in Bassingbourne, England, with the 91st Bomb Group Heavy, uh, and uh, he was shot down on a mission back from uh, someplace in uh, Western Germany on on December 24th, 1944, during the Battle of the Bulge. Crash landing just inside the Allied lines in in, in, in Belgium. So I've, I've been to Germany several times. I love it's a beautiful country, and I thank my many great friends there for having so lovingly uh, uh, shared great German culture with me. <laughs> okay, but uh, y you know, for example, um, Mr. von Bülow. Andreas von Bülow, yeah, yeah, he's a wonderful guy. I stayed with him and and his wife Anna in 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 Cologne uh, when I was last there in 2005 I believe uh, and I got to see a lot of the Rhineland uh, I've been to Berlin twice uh, and I haven't seen as much of Germany as I'd like to but I've had some great times there uh, Mike if you ever uh, with a Germany again please let me know and if it's possible I will be uh, make a face to face interview with you, uh, with you that would make me extremely glucky <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there's one more thing I would like to talk with you about your family business, and this is your mom. Your mom worked for FDR. My mother, uh, right after December 7, 41, uh, was a school teacher. She had a college degree, and she went immediately to Washington, and as part of her aptitude test, she was given a New York Times crossword puzzle, which she solved in like 23 minutes. And she became a code breaker, a cryptanalyst with the Army Security Agency that was later NSA, the National Security Agency. Uh, her work product, uh, first on Japanese codes, then later on Russian nuclear physicists, uh, went to uh, secretaries of state and war, Holland Stinson, and to FDR himself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can we um, uh, solve this mystery? Was the Japanese code um, um, broken before the attack on Pearl Harbor? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. and totally. That's that's why five aircraft carriers were not in Pearl Harbor when the attacks occurred. Okay, yeah. Then we have solved this mystery too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now let's just solve peak oil. Uh, oh well, um, well. Uh, do you think um, um, with uh, renewable energy you will make it uh, seriously in in the U.S. There is absolutely nothing that can support the edifice built by fossil fuels and the way that money works with the loans, the bubbles, the corruption, and everything else is absolutely tearing down what little alternative energy infrastructure is being built around the world, including in Germany. I had a story about that on my World News Desk today. So, no. Yeah. No. We, we, we can expect very little from that. Okay. What do you think? How long will it take uh, to make the USA to Egypt? Uh, of tomorrow, the U.S. Uh, will will not adapt uh, at all. It, it it will fail and fall apart. I, I while while Japan may go down as a nation, the United States absolutely cannot. It 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 will fragment, uh, and uh, nothing will support this. This nation was bound together by energy over vast distances, and and as the energy goes away, the law of entropy dictates exactly what's going to happen. Things break down, not up. Okay, the, the world will become smaller. <laughs> Our world most assuredly will, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much man, for this discussion. It was great, terrific. Yeah, it was very nice for me too. Thank you, Mike Rupert. Thank you, Lars Charles. Thanks, everybody. It was really a pleasure. I mean, I was surprised, really. I mean, positively surprised. I was just doing this phone call. I didn't know what to expect exactly, but the way it went, you know, really, really very stimulating, very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, it, it was my, my pleasure. It was great. And uh, ich habe es dir ja gerade schon geschrieben. Es war hochspannend. Yes, it was, it was super. Really. 
Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.